Okay, hello everyone. Welcome to today's webinar. This is Erin, part of the Softree webinars team and typically your host as opposed to your presenter, but today I get to have the really fun role of doing both. Uh, we are going to spend the next 45 minutes uh, walking through sort of a, a simplified webinar that really focuses on the basics of, of Rodinj and the fundamental steps uh, to use the software to design a rural road. Now, just a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, first off, welcome everybody. You are muted and you are going to stay muted uh, throughout uh, throughout today's presentation. But if you do have any questions, uh, I do encourage those. You're welcome to type them into that sort of question section of your GoToWebinar panel. You can expand it out, type it in. All of our question askers do remain anonymous. And if you're watching this off of YouTube in the future, uh, yeah, feel free to ask us questions there too. We do respond to them. Just type them in the comments section and we're happy to get back to you. And with that, uh, let's get started. So just a little bit about Rodeng uh, to begin with. Um, it is a geometric uh, civil design software. Uh, it is a little bit different from some other ones that you may have seen or worked with. Uh, it's a standalone program. It does not sit on top of a CAD software. And probably the most interesting thing, what I'm going to spend a bit of time here talking about, is the fact that it is modular. So that means uh, it has uh, sort of two different little programs within it that together we're going to use in our workflow. Uh, so the first of those two modules is the terrain module, and that is our module for handling and working with your surface and survey data, uh, as well as the module that we would use if we were to do some site design and non-linear projects. And then we have our location module, and that is our specialized module really built uh, to drive efficiencies when dealing with long linear pieces of infrastructure, as well as short ones as we're going to see in today's webinar. So our plan for the time that we're going to spend, uh, I'm going to kind of walk you through sort of more like a quick introduction slide on each of the key steps in our workflow. And then we're going to move over into the software uh, and I'm going to demonstrate how to do them. Now I should make a, a huge disclaimer. I do not uh, plan to treat this webinar as a Aaron teaching you how to design a road or a test of my road designing abilities. I really want you to focus on just the steps that we're talking about as a part of the workflow. So in the terrain module, uh, we've got sort of one really big key step, uh, which is you know importing our topo data. Uh, the terrain module is used to import and to verify your survey data for your existing ground uh, and existing conditions. You, know, you can bring in all different kinds of topo data. Today we're going to work with some LIDAR derived DEM data, but uh, we also work with conventional data such as total station in a variety of formats, CSV, text, uh, ASCII. Uh, we also work with LIDAR and drone data formats. Uh, and other information that may come from sort of GIS or other software such as Shape and DWG. So you're going to bring in that topo data and create a TIN model. And that is the most important first step that we're going to do. So a TIN model is a triangular irregular network surface and it represents our original ground. And we save that in a terrain file or as you're going to hear me call it a TRX file. Uh, we are going to cover a couple, I'm going to say bonus steps here at the front inside of terrain. We're going to add some extra spatial data just for uh, a little bit more context uh, as well as I'll show you how to really quickly and easily add a background ortho photo into your terrain model. So with that, uh, we're going to begin the jumping between a presentation and the software. So this blank white screen right here is terrain. Oh, actually, hang on, I've got a fancy little title slide to introduce our first step. Sorry about that. First step, import your topo data, create the TIN model, and now we jump to terrain. Uh, so this is the terrain module. It opens as a blank white screen ready to have your file or your topo data inserted into it. We use on the home ribbon here, we use this insert file button as our means of importing and inserting our data. So I'm just going to press that. And here I'm going to go and find my DEM data. So this DEM is a LIDAR derived DEM file and it is in GeoTIFF format. 
as I said, we work with other file types. If you're bringing in something from a, a total station, yeah, we can absolutely work with that. This is the humongous list of different file types that we support. Um, but for right now, let's uh, let's see how we load up this DEM. So when we select a, an import, an item, I should say, to import, it's going to give us different options if there's different uh, import specifications available. So in the case of a GeoTIFF, or a TIFF file, I should say, it could either be an image or the case that we would like, which is a raster DEM. So I'm going to select that option as I import it. And here I'm now presented with uh, a whole bunch of different options to help me finish the import of my data. One really important one I want to highlight, and this is true when you're working with LIDAR, so if you're working with LAS, LAZ, any kind of large high resolution point data, it is really important to not have display points enabled. This is going to make it really slow to import, slow to draw your screen, so having that deselected. And I also, I'm just going to turn this one off. Now, this is not a usual one to turn off, but I want to show you how to go and create that tin uh, as well manually yourself if you ever need to regenerate it. So I'm going to turn that off. If you're working with a really big data set, this is your opportunity. You can thin on import, so we can make our point resolution slider. We can adjust that. You could also add a region for strategic thinning. So if you had uh, a preliminary alignment, maybe you want to buffer that out, create a, you know, a corridor where you bring it in at full resolution, and then you adjust the rest of it through thinning. Lots of videos up on YouTube if you want to learn a little bit more about how to strategically thin, and we're happy to send some of those links through with the follow-up for this. Um, and then my final piece here, if you do happen to know the projection of your data, uh, we're going to set it here in the projection tab. And this is really useful. So having projected data allows us to easily export to Google Earth, to import a background ortho image, as well as it just relates our project to where it is in the real world and it has a whole bunch of other, yeah, really beneficial applications. So we're going to hit OK. This is going to import our data. It does come in, even though we said not to display our points, it does initially draw your points just to let you know that they're there. And then all we do is we click to the side and we're left with our extents border. So now we know our data is inside this frame, but we don't need to see those I have here, six, 640 or those so thousand points. So the final part of this first step is to create a surface model. So right now, if I was to look at the 3D view, we don't have one. And that's because we don't have a 3D surface yet. So I'm going to go up here to my terrain modeling tab, hit generate tin, and I'm going to ask it to calculate my triangles. Uh, I can also ask it to calculate my contours, and you can control the format and the interval of those. And we're just going to hit OK. And I should say, I'm working on a pretty basic business grade laptop here, so it's not going to move with blistering speed. But as you get into sort of fancier laptops, that would have been, uh, yeah, a split second on this type of pretty small data set. But anyways, you can see here, we've got our 3D tin surface, which is that prerequisite for us to be able to do a road design. So we've got that. Uh, and the next step here is we're just going to hit save. And we're going to call this Topo. OK, let's move along to our next step. We're going to add some additional spatial data. Now, it's often useful to add other context to your project, whether that is if you're in forestry, maybe you've got some block boundaries you want to import. Uh, maybe you have existing roads you'd like to see. Uh, lots of different types of additional spatial data can be added in. You could even get really crazy and combine uh, total station or CSV data with a LiDAR data set if you've got two different sources to make your surface. But today, we'll keep it pretty simple. We're going to load in a couple shape files. So the same way that we added in our topo data, our DEM data, we're also going to use that same insert button, and we're going to insert a few different shape files. Uh, and these probably would have come out of GIS. So here, we'll start by inserting our existing roads. We're just going to hit OK to accept the defaults, and you can kind of see them here. We've got the ability to change their line type if we wanted to. We'll just apply, hit Apply just to make them purple. So you can see that here. We've got our existing roads, and we're going to add two more other shapefiles. First are going to be our streams, 
I should say these streams were actually generated in our really exciting new hydrology tools in uh, in version 11. We've redone them. They're coming out soon. And yeah, stay tuned for some more exciting updates on that set. But let's change them to blue because streams obviously need to be blue. And last but not least, uh, in my fictitious project where we're making uh, a resource or I should say a low volume road off to a proposed cabin site, I do have my start and end points. So where we've got uh, an ability to come off of our existing road and where we're going to. And we'll set the symbol for those so you can see them. Again, I'm going to go with purple just because it's fun. Okay, perfect. So we've got our topo created. We've added some additional context. Uh, one more sort of fun step here to add a little bit of extra context. Um, which is adding a background ortho image. And as long as your data is geo-referenced, a really easy way to do that inside of Terrain, uh, we just click that frame, or you could honestly just select it all, uh, go up on our Home tab here to the Import Live Map section, and we're going to be able to instantly connect to a bunch of web map tile services. And this one, uh, we're able to look and see which one we want of our map sources. Uh, it does come standard with a couple, a couple options here. I think Bing's the best looking for this particular data set. Um, so I'm going to use the crop tool just to make it my image fit my extents a little bit better. And then I'm going to hit save. Uh, you can adjust the quality, and it's going to take a second here to download some tiles from the internet and to stitch them together, put them into their own terrain file, and then we're going to be putting that into the background of our project. Uh, we do have the option here, and I like to use it, uh, just putting a bit of a washout on that image file, just letting us know that it's rotating and putting the image into place. And now we have all this great extra context uh, with streams, with background imagery, and we are totally ready to move over to the other module. And I'll hit save one more time. <laughs> over to the other module location to go ahead and work through the next key steps there. So as I mentioned before, location, this is the module that was built to handle linear infrastructure. It is everything about it is meant uh, for roads, for other pieces of uh, linear infrastructure like pipelines, uh, railways. Uh, if it's long and linear, it's the perfect place to do it. So the key steps here, and there I should say there are a ton of different functions and options that you could also do as well. Uh, I'm really just focusing on those sort of absolutely mission critical steps that you need in order to be able to create a road design. So the first of those is creating a new location design where we're going to connect in and reference that uh, that topo surface that we've just developed. From there, we're going to go and set up our cross-section template and assign it to our stations or to our road in this case. We'll create our horizontal alignment as well as add some curves. We'll do the same thing with our vertical alignment. We'll create that and we'll add some curves. And then Typically, you would sort of repeat the, the fine-tuning process between your horizontal and your vertical and your cross-section um, until you're satisfied with the result. Uh, so in addition to those plan, profile, and cross-section views, we do have a whole bunch of other reporting tools that are going to provide some visual and uh, quantitative feedback as we're designing. So this includes you know, our volumes and through data tables, uh, the mass hall, and so, as well as some cost reporting. So I'm not going to go super deep into any of the other sort of cost reporting uh, tools. We're going to keep it quite quite high level today, uh, but we're happy to provide some links if you're interested into some of that other, yeah, more more deeper deeper dive into the software. Uh, and then our last two steps we're covering just adding some drainage structures and then output and reporting. So let's get uh, going on our first step inside of the location module, which is really all about uh, creating that new location design and referencing our topo surface. So this is uh, backed in terrain. I'm just an easy way to get to location, especially when you don't want to show everybody your messy desktop, uh, is to go to the setup tab uh, and to hit the location button. So that's just going to open up the other module. And once it's here, uh, most people try to do the file open and open your topo file, but uh, this is a new new road project. So we are actually going to be doing file new. 
and then it's going to prompt us to select our topo surface. So the one we created, uh, our topo here, I'll get that out of my prep folder, uh, our topo surface will reference that. If you were working with a P-line traverse, uh, so that's something sort of more typical what we see in some forestry and resource applications, you could, you could reference a traverse file. Or if you're working with uh, another design software and just want to get the benefits of designing in RoadEng and already have a surface created, you could reference that here as well. But for today, we've got our terrain file all built with our tin. We're going to hit OK. So the next piece is letting it know how do we want to start our initial alignment. Um, some people select by a coordinate or center of terrain. I actually have those great points inside of my terrain where I know that I want to start and where I want to end. So I'm just going to select my starting point uh, that I had brought in as a shape file. So that's here. Let's hit OK. And that's going to be where my cursor starts uh, as I begin. Initial cross section, just keep the default. And our location project is set up and ready for us to customize, which is our next step. So we are going to spend a little bit of time uh, before we actually get into the fun designing part, um, which is setting up our screen to do everything we want it to do. And uh, inside of RoadEng as well, or location I should say, and as well as inside of Terrain, all of these windows are very customizable, meaning that you can set labels, colors, um, the different fields below your section window, the fields that are shown in your data window, even the way that the windows are set up relative to each other. All of that is very configurable and we can save those configurations as a screen layout. And this is really useful, uh, especially when you've got different types of tasks you might be doing. So if you're looking at, you know, doing some uh, technique called road pegging, well, that's gonna have a very unique kind of configuration on your screen. Whereas um, today I'm gonna set it up to be sort of my general purpose one. I've got a screen layout I built called a webinar uh, and this one's going to give me all of my key windows, my, my section, my plan, my profile, my mass hall, uh, as well as a 3D view. Okay, uh, so this, web, this uh, screen layout, I can save it, I can share it with colleagues if we're all working on the same type of project. Uh, really, really useful. The other kind of, I'm going to say, key steps that we want to do, um, you'll notice here my background ortho image didn't come in. And that's because it was actually created in a separate terrain file. So we can add that terrain file to our background. So I'm just gonna hear background display files. And I'm just gonna go and I'm gonna add my image file in. Uh, I can adjust the draw order. So in this case, I want my image to be first, my contours and stuff on top of it. And I can adjust its washout. So we're gonna adjust that here. Yeah, actually 50 seems okay. We'll leave it at 50. But I do want to adjust this one to not be quite so washed out. So this is my contours. I'd actually like to be able to see where, where my road starts, where my road ends. Okay, ortho image in place. Uh, the other thing you might notice is we don't have very much happening in our 3D view. And that's just because uh, we've got our contours. But we're going to go and set it up so that when we start creating our road surface, uh, it's got a really nice uh, visual look inside the 3D window. And this is through our corridor surfaces. I should note in version 11, a lot of this is going to make you a fair bit more automated. But for now, we're just going to hit terrains and surfaces, hit add, hit corridor surface. You get to pick your favorite color. Uh, what are we going to pick? cyan uh, and hit OK. And so now when we go to design our road, my final merge surface of my alignment is going to be shown in the 3D. The other piece I want to do is I, I'm a big fan of having my triangle shaded. So I'm just going to select my topo here, select display triangles, select shade triangles, and I'm going to add a little bit of transparency to it. Uh, and that's so that it, I can see when I'm in cut uh, when my road's going through it. OK. We are pretty much fully set up, ready to go to the next step, which is still kind of a setup step, uh, but we're getting a little bit more into the weeds. So we're going to be configuring our cross-section template next. So a cross-section template for users of other software is very comparable to what you'd be like a sub-assembly. And there are two really important parts to the cross-section. 
setting up and configuring. The first is actually adjusting the template to have the, the specifications, uh, let's say for example, the width of your road as well as the slopes it needs. And then we need to apply that cross-section template using something called the Assign by Range dialog. And let's take a look at how to do that. So our cross-section templates are set up uh, inside of what we call our template editor. And the template editor is basically like a sandbox. Um, it allows us to test and play with different cross-section templates and see their behavior. For example, right now my template that's selected is a, is a rural paved template. If I was to pull this up, let's see what happens to it. Okay, my ditches have disappeared. If I pull it down, oh look, I have ditches and you can see the slopes. Um, it's a great spot, especially as you're starting to work with more complicated templates to play around. You can see them in a few different views and typical cut, typical fill, uh, and the different slopes to understand what's happening to them. So the template that I'm going to work with today, uh, I'm going to work with a, our resource low volume template. So this is a, and I'll go back here just to a sort of typical, typical one. It's uh, a gravel road template as opposed to a paved road template uh, and a little bit more appropriate for my fictitious example of a road to a nice cabin. Um, if you press the plus sign next to any template, uh, it's going to open and show you the different components that make it up. So a template itself is a collection of components and each of those components is like a fillable form. And I should say they, the, these fillable forms uh, have a left and a right. Uh, if you set one up, so for example, we set up our left, we can copy and paste it as our right. Uh, so you can do it once, it's kind of handy. Um, but if we click into the, our roadway component here for our resource, uh, you can see our, our road width and it's highlighted in magenta. Uh, right now it's set as three meters. So the left side at three meters, the right side at three meters, we've got a six meter wide road. So we're gonna change that to be eight meters wide. So we'll make this side four and we can go into our right and we can do the same. Or we could have copied and pasted it. Uh, other options, you can control your slopes and I'll show you a little bit, especially with the ditch, it's kind of a better one to see visually. Um, we can control the slope on our ditch so right now, ditch slope here, set is two to one. We could adjust it and, and you can watch it. Oh, I've got my view, sorry, it's a little bit off there. You can see it a bit better. So you can see the change in the slope, uh, but we're gonna leave it at two to one. Perfect, so that is just a really quick introduction to how we would modify a template. Uh, there are a ton of different components that you can start to use and combine uh, in order to be able to create uh, your typical cross-section. And we can access those through the e-library. You can bring them in uh, and start to combine them. And we have yeah, hours and hours worth of content up on YouTube talking about how to work with templates. So I'm just gonna hit cancel here. We've customized our particular template that we'd like to use today. So we're just gonna hit OK to close. I am being prompted to recalculate. If you haven't made any changes, like I have I have yet to make any, I'm gonna just hit cancel here. Um, but it usually, when prompted with that, you will want to say yes, recalculate my road for me. So as I mentioned, there's two steps. The first step was this template editor. The second step is assigned by range. And this is where we say, okay, this particular station range uh, is going to have this particular template assigned to it. And we can have as a lot of different templates assigned to different element parts of our station range. But for today, pretty simple road. We're just gonna pick one. We're gonna use that resource low volume road and a bit of a trick in the software. So this here, our from station and our to station are shown as dot dot. So in road eng, I should say in location, dot dot is kind of a way of saying my beginning and my end uh, without having to put explicit station ranges. So we'll hit add edit, and now you can see my template has been updated. Fun quick little note, there's a couple templates that are gonna be always in your template list. Uh, the taper template, so you can use this to go as a transition between two different templates. So I'll give you a nice smooth transition between template types and the bridge no cut no fill template so you'd use this in a situation where you don't want to have any earthworks being calculated you just apply that that uh, that template to a particular station range okay so we've got that done in this case we did make a change we'll hit update and recalculate and we are ready 
to move to the actual fun stuff where you get to see me clicking a little bit more, possibly making more mistakes as, as it happens when you're in a live webinar. <laughs> so the next step is creating our horizontal alignment. Um, yeah, and it's it's pretty easy. So I, I will do that here in my plan window to add a horizontal. So just to show you where we are, so we, we've got our start point and I selected that as my initial alignment position uh, and you can see the dot over here to where we're going. So to create a horizontal alignment it is it is as easy as right click in your plan window, select the add edit IP tool and now we can start and you can use the contours a bit as a guide. We can start designing pan here, designing our road. Uh, I'm just going to expand the 3D window just to show you a little bit about what's happening. So when we create our initial horizontal alignment, uh, we have yet to actually create a profile. So it looks a bit funny in the 3D view because we're just draping on the ground. Uh, so right now our alignment and our mass hall and everything is calculating based on just if it was draped on the ground without an actual profile. Uh, but before we can go and create our profile, we're going to go over and do the next step, uh, which usually and typically we recommend adding your horizontal curves at this point. So inside of location, we do have curve panels uh, and we're going to use the horizontal curve panel to add some curves to our project. Okay. The horizontal curve panel, if it's not open already, which mine is right here, uh, you access it through the bottom nav bar. And we typically would recommend, and I'll just switch out of that edit mode. Uh, I'm going to go and just select my first, get to the beginning of my road, and I'll move forward to my first IP. So our curve panel is tied to your road class specifications. And I don't want to talk about this in too much detail, but uh, you have different road class specifications. So this particular road is going to be a 50 kilometer an hour road. And it's pulling all of these different tables uh, connected to my road class. So this is, uh, I've got our, you know, super elevation table, side friction, et cetera. And all of that uh, except comes standard with the, the values from TAC and AASHTO. But uh, if you're in a different jurisdiction or you have different standards, uh, you can update these. And if you are uh, one of uh, our clients that are sort of in the more resource sector, perhaps you don't even want to have this super complicated curve section and you can just enable right here, simple curves. Uh, and that's gonna give you a simplified curve panel uh, to work with. Okay, so I've updated my design speed. I'm just gonna hit okay. Let it recalculate for fun. And now we're ready to add our first curve. So to add our first curve, we move to our first IP. We're going to select, in this case, circular curve. I'm going to set my radius at 100. My design speed is 50. And I'm going to hit apply. And that has generated my first curve. Now, typically, uh, a lot of folks work with the same curve specifications throughout their project. So you can set that as your default curve to avoid having to type in more numbers in the future. You can move to your next IP. And you can get that default curve with the little green arrow button here and hit apply. Alternatively, if you have a really long project and have a lot of curves, this auto generate curves button uh, is going to become your new friend. Uh, it allows us to apply that default curve to every single IP in the project um, with the click of a button and not having to move through it. So now, uh, relatively quickly, we were able to generate curves for our three IPs in our project. And one other quick note, uh, I'm sure you can see them here, but we've got our, our beginning curve and curve labels being generated. And these labels are actually tied to the screen layout I have. Now you could you know, go and turn them on here in the label section, lots of options for how you control your labels. But uh, once you've got them set up in a way you like, having them as a part of your screen layout is really useful. And it, again, it's all about finding efficiencies and reducing the amount of, of setup and prep you need to do. So that's part of my screen layout here. Okay, next step. We did our curves. Let's go and create our vertical alignment. Um, and again, I just want to stress, this is not a test of how well Aaron can design a road. Uh, it's really just about showing you the tools that you can use in order to do it yourself. So. 
uh, we create our vertical alignment inside of our profile window. Same kind of deal, we've got our add edit IP tool uh, and we're gonna go and literally just start clicking in our vertical profile or alignment. Uh, as we're designing, uh, we're seeing a lot of things update. So I'm not sure if you were watching it, but the section window was changing as I updated. Our 3D window was also changing and so was our mass hall. And as you can see, I did a, a pretty rubbish job with my initial clicks. Uh, we can configure our mass hall to show us a few more options, such as like what's free haul and overhaul, as well as borrow and waste. So I'll just turn those on. And now I can go back and I can start fine tuning my design to try and get it a little bit more balanced. And this is really the iterative part. Uh, sometimes you nail it like that. Yes, I was a little bit worried about this part, guys. Um, we also have tools inside the software uh, as part of our optimization package that can allow you to do that. Uh, I'm gonna call it my easy button uh, a little bit more automatically. So it balances your cuts and fills. Okay, so we have a profile. It uh, miraculously balances in a relatively fast fashion for a live webinar audience. Uh, and the next step uh, is to go and add curves to it as well. So this is really similar to how we added them uh, for horizontal curves. We're gonna use the vertical curve pa panel uh, and we're gonna add in some parabolic curves. So let's go and do that. So vertical curve panel uh, is this button down here, or if it was open, you can just search for it over here. Uh, we're gonna navigate to our first IP, which we are already at, uh, we're say parabolic curve. In this case, my K value is 12, my design speed is 50, and I'm gonna hit apply. And it is going to generate my curve for me. Same kind of thing, set our default curve, move to the next IP, and we can hit uh, get default and apply to avoid having to type in more numbers. Um, Unfortunately, there's no button to automatically apply all of the curves, but that is something that can be done through the, the optimization stuff. It does automatically add your curves. I uh, get my defaults, hit apply. Okay, and then we are done adding our curves. Uh, and we are flying through with time. This is excellent. We're gonna have time for questions, I hope. Uh, we've got a couple more sections, steps left. Um, so this is, uh, yeah, this is gonna be culverts. We're gonna add some drainage structures to our design, uh, really useful. And then we'll eventually show you as well how to get a table for them. Um, once you're done your design, I am just gonna do something here. I'm just gonna quickly update my 3D display list just to make sure my design looks great. Okay, um, we've got, getting out of edit ed mode, so I click wrong. Uh, we are crossing over a stream, so this is, Definitely the most logical place for me to demonstrate how to add a culvert. So we're just gonna go here uh, and click. And you can see here in our profile, kind of by low point. Perfect, okay. So to add a culvert, you find your location that you would like to add a culvert at. And then we go to the culvert editor panel. So that was open already in my screen layout, but if it's not on yours, you can add it here through the culvert panel button. And all we do with our station selected, we press add. Uh, alternatively, we could actually type in the station if we wanted to. Uh, so we could move this over ever so slightly. So say 242. And in this case, it's a natural stream channel. Hit OK. And our culvert is added. Um, once it's added, we can control. We can set the skew to auto as well as we can control its size. So in this case, uh, a a one meter culvert uh, and we can control its shape. And we'd probably wanna rotate this one a bit, but for the purposes of the webinar, I'm not going to. Um, yeah, so that's kind of adding it. And you can also go in, you can look at it and find it in your 3D. You can see the pipe included here in my 3D window. And that's how to add culverts. We could go and do this at other parts in our design. You can also if, uh, add them here, uh, additional culverts at set spacing. So if you do need to have a set spacing of culverts, that option exists. So this is how to add a, I'm gonna call them simple culvert or cross drains. Uh, we've got a lot of resources if you're dealing with major culvert replacements. Uh, they are obviously a little bit bigger. We need to figure out some excavation volumes on them um, and some more details. So that process, uh, we've got it documented on our YouTube channel. And again, we'll put that one in the link collection too. Okay, 
almost there. Uh, let's do some of the fun ones. Uh, so I'm going to show you a little bit about drive through. I think it's a great optional step, really useful for just kind of checking to see what you've actually designed. Um, and we access that one through the 3D window. So we'll just go to the 3D window for a second. I'm just going to navigate to the beginning of my project. Click the 3D window options up here, the tab. Uh, and I'm going to press drive through. So drive through is kind of fun. We can include a target object just to see, and we can set that up, by the way, with a certain distance and height to match our road class specifications if we're looking to test our site stopping distance. So hit OK. I'll go a little bit faster not to take too much time. But yeah, we can test to see how our road drives. And because we set transparency with our terrain uh, background topo surface, we can actually see when we're traveling through cut um, and when we're out in fill. So a really useful tool just for doing a quick visual check on your project, um, and that's available in the 3D window up here in the ribbon tab. Okay, so that was drive-through mode. Last but not least, um, a road design is pretty much nothing unless you've communicated it properly. So I'm gonna show you how to get to a few different reporting and output options. The first of which we're gonna take a look at the data window uh, and how you can configure that as well as export it. And then we'll take a look at our built-in documentation generator. It's probably our most powerful output option, that's multi-plot. Uh, and here we can sort of set up almost like a screen layout, uh, set up, share, and reuse it. Uh, and then we'll take a look at some of the other different saving and exporting options. In particular, we'll talk a little bit about Land XML. So let's jump back in this offer for the last time of this presentation and we'll take a look at the data window. So I don't have a data window showing currently, but I can create one here by pressing the data button. And now I can customize it. So like pretty much every other window inside of RoadEng, uh, we can configure it and then we can actually save these settings that I'm doing right now as a part of our screen layout. So I'm going to press the data options button and I'm going to start by configuring which columns or fields I'd like to see. So I'm going to remove these ones. I'd like to keep my station number and then I'm going to go down into my volumes folder and here we're just going to get some simple cut fill and then our surface one volume. So surface one is our um, sort of surfacing volume that's being applied uh, yeah, it feels like our gravel aggregate on top of the road as a part of our template. Uh, you can actually figure out what different components of templates are each volume. So if we were to go back to our template and hover over it, we'd see that surface one is that, uh, that aggregate up on the top. So I'm gonna hit okay. I'm going to include my design totals. And uh, here I just wanna also set which sort of intervals I'd like to show uh, inside my data table. So right now it's showing my profile points, which I definitely don't want. Uh, I'm gonna go with my auto interval points. And you can actually change the auto interval points to any kind of interval that you would like. So if you'd like it to be more frequent than 20, you can, you can double click to change that. So I'm gonna ask it to display my auto interval points of every 20 meters. I'm gonna hit okay. And now I have a data table. And the really fun part about this, and this is really sad because my design is so balanced, um, if I was to go and change my alignment, uh, the data table is instantly updating as I make my mass hall worse than it was. Put that sort of back. Okay, so that's a data table for cut and fill. Uh, another great output option or a great, uh, yeah, thing you can generate with a data table, and we'll create one more, is for example, if you do have a full list of culverts and you would like to know, you know what their sizes are and what their lengths are and what station they're going to. So we can create another data window that displays that type of information. So we'll select what kind of points we want. In this case, culvert insertion points, because we only want to know the stations that the culverts are at. And then we can configure our columns to help us report that culvert information. So we'll start with our station and then we'll go back up here to the culverts folder and we're going to select our culvert diameter so we can know how big it is and our culvert length. Hit OK. And now we can understand when we go to order the supplies for our road, 
what our culvert uh, material requirements are going to be. Okay, so that's a very brief introduction to uh, output through the data table. Uh, if you wanted to export this to an Excel, uh, like to a CSV file, uh, we could select on the data window, export, we could select file, or we could just select clipboard and copy and paste it into Excel. So that's an option for you uh, if you're looking to transfer any data in, in a data window out of RoadEng. As I mentioned, the most powerful output option um, is multiplot. And, and this is really meant to act almost like a screen layout does where you can create preset formats uh, and preset configurations that you can really easily you know, save, share, and reuse. So each preset format kind of is tied to a specific page size. So here I'm just gonna go and change my page size to an ANSI D. And now I'm going to go up to our web library and cheat a little bit and get a pre-made template that's available. So I'm gonna get a plan profile here. And now I've got a plan profile for the project that we just designed um, in a preset template. Now I could obviously go in and modify any of these things. If I wasn't happy with the scale, we could change it. Uh, we could do something here if I'm not happy with how it fits called a scroll. So this is where I'm gonna manually adjust the position a little bit. And I'm just to let you know what I'm doing because you can't see it. I'm hitting my shift key and I'm just gonna move it up so I can center it if I want it a bit, a bit more. So you have control and you go in and you can update logos and change text and add different data windows um, to these multi-plots. And then you can actually save them as a book or you could save the chapter. Um, and that, there's a lot of information again about multi-plot. We're just kind of surface level here uh, as a bit of an intro, but that's how you'd create a multi-plot. And then you've got a whole bunch of functionality for saving and sharing it. Uh, we can also get uh, a cross section. I'll take this one. Uh, a cross section chapter, and now it's going to display all the different cross sections. And one of our most common support questions is why isn't it showing all the sections that I need? And so to control that, it comes down again to the point types you've got selected. And we do that here in the layout. So with my cross section view selected, I'm going into layout, and now I'm going to go into my point types. So again, I'm gonna set it to be my auto interval, and then it's really important to have those culvert insertion points as well. And for fun, let's change the layout a little bit. There we go. And now it has created not just one page, but uh, six, or I should say four pages of cross sections for me at my 20 meter interval, as well as that one here, as you can see it, that has my culvert. So that's a quick look at multiplot. This can now be saved, uh, printed to PDF or printed to a plotter uh, and shared with your contractor or any other stakeholders in the project. The last output option we're just gonna quickly touch on is how you would export to a different format. So a really common one is saving as land XML and using that for either machine control, construction staking, uh, or maybe even even going back to another software. So if you were working with Civil 3D or one of the Bentley products, uh, our recommended format for going in between them is Land XML because it uh, maintains that sort of alignment structure. So we don't have an export button <laughs> in RoadEng. We use a Save As button. So I'm going to hit Save As. I'll we'll just call this Alignment. And then I can use the drop down here to select the different type of format I want to put it out to. So here, we'll choose Land XML, hit Save, and then you can set up how you want it to export. So there's a lot of flexibility, including with corridor surfaces and cross sections, but just, yeah, a simple Land XML export here for my alignment. And I could use that for machine control or construction staking. And with that, uh, really brief intro, or not over time, I'm so happy. Um, I did just want to highlight, uh, this is really the tip of the iceberg in terms of functionality. So RoadEng is as much or as little as you want to do. Um, we can make it a lot more complicated and handle a lot more interesting projects. You know, if you've got a culvert example that we presented in a past webinar, uh, we can have, you know, obviously road widenings, uh, different wall structures. This is a new MSC wall template that we've got out and available, uh, as well as things like simple intersections. So we covered all of these in 
Previous webinars are up on our YouTube channel if you want to check them out. And with that, we'll move over into questions. Um, and I should say, I've got in the wings, uh, I've got Matt, who's our resident webinar host. I thought I'd give him a break today, so I'm, I did the presenting, but he is here for any super technical questions if you want to ask them. So uh, with that, we'll get to the first one. Um, the first question, so rather than using images from Bing or Google, can we use our own ortho images? And the answer to that question is yes, you can. Um, one of the, I guess I showed it a little bit to start. So when we went to go insert our TIFF file, I was initially presented with the option of, do you want to insert, insert this as an image? So if you have an ortho photo, if it's in say geo TIFF format or TIFF format, uh, you can absolutely insert it. And we have a whole bunch of tools, uh, move size, rotate, uh, as well as move size, rotate by vectors that can help you get it into place. Now, working with live maps is particularly helpful because it automatically gets it into the right place for you. But uh, yeah, you can you can definitely import your own uh, ortho images. Okay, hopefully I answered your question correctly. Um, the next question, any recommendations on where I can find LiDAR data? And hey, I might, I might ask Matt, he is a constant finder of LiDAR data uh, for clients of ours. So Matt, if you want to unmute. All right. I was thinking I wouldn't have to wouldn't have to talk for this one. Um, yeah, uh, lidar data you can find it in. Uh, well, it's available. It will depend on on your location. Uh, a lot of jurisdictions will have uh, publicly available uh, lidar data. If well, uh, some of the the provinces in Canada do and. Uh, a lot of the the states do so there's the the usgs and noaa are uh, great sources of information um in the us uh canada split usually by province um and uh then for well, other places like uh australia and new zealand um there's uh also, uh, countrywide uh, programs for that. Uh, yeah, and, and not every location within those countries has full coverage, but it's certainly worth a search. Um, with that being said, we have a, a list. Oh, Aaron has it up already. Uh, a list of uh, some really great LiDAR sources on our, our website. Um, yeah, if if you're interested in that, you can certainly go on there, click around, and it might save some uh, Googling to find things. Definitely. So that's uh, softtree.com, and it's a uh, free LiDAR. Is the is the slug? I mean, so, yeah, I pulled that up while you were chatting. Um, okay, we're going to do two more questions and then call it because we're a little bit over time. Uh, the next question is: You mentioned traverses. Do you have any more information on them? Matt, I am not the Traverse expert. Uh. Um, we've got some videos on our, our YouTube page. We've got resources on our, our knowledge uh, base side of the uh, side of our website, and we've also got documentation in our well, our actual training manual. Um, some of the videos on YouTube are probably getting a, a little dated, and uh, we do have plans to do a uh, well, traverse-focused uh, webinar in the in the fall here. So, awesome. Okay, last question, and I can definitely handle this one. Uh, they would like the contact information for technical questions. That's an easy one. Uh, if you yeah, want to write this down, anybody who's there, you're welcome to, to reach out to our technical team. Uh, it goes to support.team at softtree.com, and we'd be happy to, well, I should say they'd be happy <laughs> to help you to the best of their abilities. And with that, uh, hey, everybody, thanks for spending Thursday uh, 45 minutes of watching me play in the software. Uh, I had fun. Hopefully you did too. Picked up a little bit of information about how to use the software. And if you have any further questions, please do reach out to us at support.team at softree.com. Uh, and well, yeah, with that, have an awesome rest of your day, everybody. Bye.